And tonight we have a very special presenter here. Um, we have someone who is from the guide class of 2018. So she's a veteran now. Born and raised in the Middle East. She's had a 30 year career as an art director. And she is the creator of the award-winning displays in the Visitor Center. Some of the awards that she's in, um, received include the Ingenuity Award, and that is an award that is granted by the Director of State Parks himself, Armando Quintero, is that right? I should yep, know since I'm right. working for him, right? <laughs> um, and she has also received the Governor's Award for her contributions to the Unsung Heroes exhibit in the Visitor Center. She's the creator of the Julia Morgan Anniversary logo and the creator of the interpretive panels for the Julia Morgan tour. And looking forward to hearing her talk about Arabic calligraphy at Hearst Castle tonight. Please welcome Sharon, excuse me, Fultz. Thanks, Margaret. I thought it would just be a few of my close friends here tonight, so I wasn't planning yes. on using the mic. But I think this might be better. What do you think? Does it work? Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, that better. Yeah. yeah. All right. How's that? Good. Good. All right. So, let's get going here. So, thanks everybody for coming tonight, and thank you, Margaret, for that amazing introduction. I will hope. I hope I can live up to it all. And. Uh, it's exciting to do this. I've been planning this for like four months, so I'm glad to get it out of my head. <laughs> All right, so when in Cambria, you find a pointer stick from the facility, right? Okay. <laughs> so uh, I've, I agreed to do this presentation on Arabic calligraphy at Hearst Castle because I do have a background knowing some Arabic, and uh, a lot of people are always asking me, what does this mean? What about this? Is that Persian? Is it Arabic? I finally decided, okay, I'll do this. We'll get some clarification. And then as I started to dig deep, I actually learned a few things myself. Woo! So I'm pretty excited about sharing this information with all of you. And what I'm gonna talk about tonight, I'm gonna try to explain a little bit about Arabic, not, not to, over not to bog down on Arabic, but everything I am going to talk about eventually comes into play. So bear with me in the beginning, especially. Uh, I'm going to talk about Arabic, talk about Farsi, the uh, language of the Persian uh, Iranians, people in Persia, and then I'll get into the Arabic uh, tiles, the Arabic uh, situations that we have at the castle, and then a few other little goodies along the way. Okay, so let's get started. First of all, I think it's important that you know my credentials. And uh, so these two are my parents. I was born in Egypt. These are my parents on the camel. And uh, here's proof. This is my birth certificate. <laughs> yes, I can see that. I thank you. <laughs> is that Arabic? That's Arabic, yes. And I can read that. And my name's up there. <laughs> Point to your name. How do you write Sharon? How do you write Sharon? Point to your name. Well, here's the date, and um, where is my name? Yeah, here I am, right here. Oh. Sharon Rose Walker. Oh, wow. Now you know my full name. <laughs> yes, I can read that. Oh, sorry, I went the wrong way. And then I grew up in Sudan. I went to Arabic school, grades one through four. There I am. Yeah. Oh. There I had to wear a uniform way back then. So, no big deal. Here I am again. And just to point out, we've got some Arabic on the blackboard, Arabic up here, so this is proof I'm not making it up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The next man has scored it up. <laughs> and then believe it or not, this is my second grade report card. I was looking for things as I was making this presentation, and guess what? Mom and Dad kept my second grade report card. And I thought it was kind of cool because I was starting to figure out what, what I was good at back in second grade, and guess what? 
I scored really high in Arabic handwriting. <laughs> yes. And so here are my credentials, everybody. These are my credentials. Second grade. I came to the United States to attend college, and I studied Islamic art and Islamic and Islamic history, just out of interest for where I grew up. And then I also became a calligrapher and a lettering artist. My, my major was art, so it was kind of a natural thing for me to want to do that. And then after college, I moved to Alexandria, Egypt, where I taught English. And while I was there, I enrolled in an Arabic calligraphy class. Men in one room, women in the other room. The teacher made us little quills out of bamboo, and we copied verses from the Quran. From the, he wrote them all on the blackboard, and we learned different styles of Arabic script. So here are some pages from my copy books. This is one. The teacher's marks are the red, okay? <laughs> another one, and another one. So why am I showing you three different pages? Because hopefully even to you, you can see we have different scripts going on here. And so this is one kind of style of Arabic writing. This is another one. This is another style. And this is a, another style. So four different styles that I had to learn. And um, this top line says the exact same thing because this is the very first verse in the Quran, it's also the very first verse of every chapter in the Quran. So it says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the magnificent, the uh, benevolent, the merciful. And that will, I will continue on that theme a little bit later. So that's why I just tell you that. Oh. Let's talk a little bit about the art of Arabic calligraphy. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful writing that you see on the tiles and so forth. So Islam forbids the imitation of human or animal form. Artists then perfected the art of Arabic script. And Arabic is the language of the Quran, so artists are doing something to honor Islam. Islamic art forms decorate the walls of mosques and shrines. And usually those art forms come in the shape of geometric shapes, floral elements, which are often referred to as arabesque and Arabic calligraphy. So I'm gonna show you some examples of some beautifully done walls, mosques or shrines. And so here's one. This is in Iran, Shah's Mosque in Iran. We've got the arabesque. We've got the geometric shapes everywhere. And then we have the, the tiles with the Arabic calligraphy. They go all the way around there and all the way around there. Same mosque. More tiling at the top and in here. And another mosque, this one's in, in Turkey. And no, yeah, this one is in Turkey. And look at that. That looks pretty tough to read. I think even for your for an Arabic speaker who's really well versed in reading and writing Arabic, that's pretty difficult to read. This is these also are the little sections with Arabic. Here's another uh, detail from a mosque decoration in Iran. So you can probably see we've got the Arabic writing here. Also see they've got it here. But then did you realize this back here, the gold mm -hmm. is Arabic as well? And did anybody think that this is Arabic writing? Mm -hmm. With those extenders that create a beautiful design. Mm -hmm. This might look a little more familiar. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. Does it remind you of the theater tiles? Mm -hmm. yeah. This happens to be from Turkey, where our theater tiles are from. All the letters go together, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and here's Lisa, hi. So let's talk a little bit about the Arabic alphabet. And all this will make sense, okay? I'm not trying to teach you Arabic tonight. So the Arabic alphabet has 28 letters, plus the vowel marks, which are little squiggles. So the little squiggles that you see everywhere, all those little things, those are vowels. Now the dots are part of the letters, but all the other little squiggles are vowels. Many beautiful inscriptions are difficult to read. They're very artistically written. The letters are all intertwining shapes. They're on top of each other. They kind of go one word starts here, one word here. And so that makes it pretty difficult to read. 
they're also difficult to read because most of, most of these of these beautifully calligraphed inscriptions are from the Quran. And so it's like reading the King James Bible, or maybe it's like reading Shakespeare. It's really, really old Arabic. So unless you are somebody who really understands to be able to read Arabic, it's gonna be difficult for many people, except for this phrase right here. This phrase right here is exactly what I had from my copy books. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> the way I said it. Okay. So one thing I just want to point out. We've got. It starts here. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So we've got a word here, word here, word here, word here. Oh Everything's on top of each other. Hmm. So it's tough to read. But if someone is a Muslim, or even even me, this was real easy for me to pick out because I know the words. It's kind of like if you know the the words to a song or something. Oh yeah, you can see it really quickly. So there are basically six or seven styles of Arabic calligraphy. And when I say styles, I'm talking about the very beginning of writings in the Quran. There are six or seven, depending on the source, styles. Now, of course, Arabic has hundreds of fonts, just like we have hundreds of fonts on our computers. But the basic one, there's about six or seven. At Hearst Castle, we have two. And some of you from your, those of you who are guides or have been guides, you might remember this word, nas. It's in our guide manual for the theater vestibule tire, tiles. They call it nasli, nas or nas, nasli. It's a very common script. And this again says, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Same verse. This is another style that we have at the castle. It's called kufik. And you can see these letters are very angular. They're very square. Now this, I have to say, is a little bit stylized, but it says the same thing as this does. It says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is an extremely old style. This is a very common like, newspaper style. So I want you to notice one thing. You see all these little squiggles I talked about? They are not present here. So Arabic can be written without the little squiggles, but Calligraphers often enjoy using them because they're very decorative, like this. Whoa. So this, this is extremely decorative style. It's called Thulu, and uh, it's hard to master. And uh, all these little squiggles, the calligrapher uses them to their advantage to make it even more beautiful. We don't have that one at the castle. And then calligraphers love to just go crazy with design. So taking something like this, and even the words are stylized on the edges, so this would be your Kufic script, the one I just mentioned. And then they've added some knots and lines. And then here's another one. This is the Thulu script. This has, this is again, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Each one of these say that. I've chosen a verse that is exactly the same throughout, so that you can kind of get the idea that it's all saying the same thing. So here you've got the words on top of each other. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and it's all done in the circle. And uh, so they love to play around. I could go on and on and show you so many examples. It would be fun. So let's move on and talk about Persian script. Yes. So it's basically read right to left. Yeah, yes. Up and yeah. Down. yeah. Right to left. Right to left. Arabic the top. No. no. It's just that the, the calligrapher chose to do that. Like I was saying, people. Some of them put words on top of each other. So it's just a matter of artistic. Uh, yeah. So the circle one could that be compared to us doing a logo, yeah, say for it like could a cattle be. brand, absolutely, or Taco yeah. Bell or yeah. whatever? It would that could. be why you would do that? Yeah. And if you go online and look up Arabic calligraphic design, you'll find in the shapes of a bird or just beautiful, beautiful. But my point is that the Arabic calligraphers love to embellish the alphabet because it's a, a very high form of art. And so they've just gone crazy with it. Sharon? Yeah. I can't, I'm having a hard time hearing something. You can't hear me. You know what I'm going to change this? There's a seat in the front. Yeah, come up and there. thank you for Move telling me. Oh, Tim. It's you're like so all those awesome. people on your floor <laughs> did not tell you till the end. <laughs> I do. How would you break it up? Break it up. How's this? That's better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Bye. <laughs> yes, Tim. So, all the different forms, it would be appropriate to copy the Quran. There, these would all be used if you were going to copy the Quran. 
Sure. But you could use it for anything. Yeah. We could use it for a certificate or whatever. It's my, my point is that Arabic calligraphy is a highly developed art form because Islam forbids the use of human and animal form. Now, I know we've got human and animal forms in, in um, places like, like Sea House, okay? So that's Persian, so that's a little bit of a different story. But pure Islam, if you go to Saudi Arabia, Arabia, to Mecca, they don't want you to, you won't see much of any kind of human or animal form. So they, they just go crazy with the geometric shapes, the floral elements, and also the, uh, the, uh, the, the script, yes? In temples, does the placement of the text reflect any of the value of the words being shown? Like, for example, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. She's from Mexico. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but looping back, uh, of all these scripts you're showing us, that Naski. Naski? Na, Naski. I'm gonna, I'm, you're you are so okay. going to make me work my pronunciation. That's okay. When I get to the Persian stuff, <laughs> no. I won't pronounce anything but well. Your, your birth certificate, that same script. Basically. Yeah. So if you got the newspaper, it'd be Nusqui. And it, you know, that is so minor, it really doesn't matter. So that's why when I hear guides say, oh, and this is the Nusqui script, it doesn't really matter. If it, that, I mean, that's really not a point that you have to make. I just like to point it out because we've heard that term. So is it common for people to know all of the scripts that you're talking about for separate styles? Does everybody realize that there are four scripts? Um, so I'm talking about calligraphic styles. So today, everybody's got computers, just like we all have computers, and you can go in and pick a, a font, and uh, Arabic speakers can pick fonts as well, and make things look a little cool or, you know, modern or whatever, it's very square. Is there an Arabic version of Times New Roman? <laughs> yeah, they probably have Arabic Times New Roman. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, as a reader, mm -hmm. How do you pick out what is flourish, what is decorative, and what is actual script that they are communicating a word or a letter with? Well, you know, the le if you just know the alphabet. Okay. Yeah. I mean, right. I can read this. Okay. And I have a, I mean, I have a fourth grade education in Arabic. Okay. So I can read these. So I, and I can read. Uh, a lot of times I, people ask me, so what does that say? I said, well, I can tell you what all the letters are, but I don't necessarily know what the verse says because it's that high Arabic that I don't, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I can't get into a political discussion with anybody either. <laughs> yeah, it's beyond my fourth grade education. Okay. All right. So hopefully it's all clear. Is it fuzzy? No. Okay. No. All right. Good. Let's go move on to Persian script. All right. So Persia is an old world, an old word for Iran, and maybe went into some other areas. This isn't my expertise. But you can refer to a Persian person, or a per Persian food, or the Persian language, which is technically Farsi. So the language really, the name for the language is Farsi. You can have, so you can have an Iranian person, you can have Iranian food, but you don't have, I speak Iranian. You don't speak Iranian, you speak Farsi. You also speak Persian. It's the same thing interchangeably in, in that context, okay? So, We're not English, but we speak it. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the Persian script uses the Arabic alphabet, exact same alphabet, plus four more characters. So there's a few letters they, that they have, like P and V, are not in Arabic, but they are in, Pers in per Persian or Farsi. And the Persian writing style is, is called Nastalik. This is not important. It consists of long, swoopy forms. And uh, so it looks kind of like this. And I can read that even though it's Persian. Why? Because I know the Arabic alphabet. And what does it say? It says Farsi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so basically it's the word Farsi in Farsi. And so here's a Persian script. It, it has these long, flowy, swoopy lines. And it's, it, it, you normally see these kinds of um, inscriptions in really old manuscripts and, and places like that. But the alphabet is the same. 
So it's primarily, Farsi is primarily spoken in Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and some other areas. So let's look at some Persian script at the Hearst Castle. You're all familiar with the, uh, the rug in C house. All these little inscriptions everywhere, all these little ones. And then we also have the plate in C house. So when I first came to Hearst Castle, I studied that plate and I thought, oh, that's Arabic because I can read a word right here. It says a bomb and that means food. And I thought, okay, that's Arabic. Even though I don't know all the other words, I know that one. And then I started really studying it because I don't think it even says in our manual. I started studying it and I said, oh, we've got a couple of those other characters that are not part of Arabic. So this is not Arabic, but maybe the re reason I know that word is because just like English and Spanish, we have a few words that uh, we have that are Spanish that are part of the English language or French or whatever. They used to have the same thing in Arabic and Farsi. So I was wrong in my initial thought because I didn't study it well enough. And so now I see, I know there's a couple of other letters there. And so I concluded that this is Farsi. Oh, one more thing I wanted to say. The inscription on this plate is really crude. Okay, it's not done very well. And um, even Tim, you're a calligrapher. You know that when you're a good calligrapher, you have nice even strokes and the thins and the thicks have to be nice and clean. Well, guess what? This yes. letter right here, yeah. Oops. and that letter right there, and that letter right there, they're all the same letter, but they look pretty sloppy. And so this is a pretty, not a very good example of um, the Farsi. A student's play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. In there. yeah. yeah. Do you use pens or brushes? Well, for a plate, because this is a ceramic plate, you'd use a brush. Yeah. You, you dip the, the brush into a glaze, so that's how it's done, <clears throat> on a glaze, and then it gets fired. Mm. However, this um, Persian rug that's hanging in Mr. Hurst's bedroom in the North Wing is an exquisite example of the Farsi script. It's beautifully done, especially to be on a carpet, on something that had to be woven. And all the letters are just beautifully done. Here's a closer look. So let's get back to Arabic. Calligraphy at Hearst Castle. And we all know and love these tiles. 16th century Turkey, we see them every day. And I've heard some guys say that some of the tiles are upside down. I've heard guides say that the word God is on these tiles. I'm sure that somebody on your tour told you that and you believed them because they happened to be from the Middle East and you figured they were right. Well, neither one is true. <laughs> what is true that we all know is that they're jumbled. And three of the tiles, however, are properly joined. And in my opinion, there's a couple more tiles that are properly joined, but don't take my word for it. Here is a letter from, uh, this is a, guide at Hearst Castle who wrote to the American University in Cairo back in 1996 and they asked for an explanation about the Arabic that we have at, the, at Hearst Castle. And what uh, this professor said, that these tiles in the theater lobby are considerably jumbled and then he points to the placement of these three tiles and he says these go together, which they do. And uh, he also says there's one word, only one word that I can make out in this context and it's the word out which means servant of God. So that was what he gave us. And so I have done you a favor and gone in and showed you where those three tiles are. And then in my opinion, these tiles also go together. There are no words here that, that go across the tiles. There is one letter right here that goes through. And so probably the professor didn't want to commit to this because who knows what kind of Xerox he got back in 1996. Yeah, right. Who knows if it was color or black and white, but definitely the design looks like it works. And in my opinion, this goes together. And so I believe these two tiles also go together. And then this is what he's talking about. The word ab is right here. So that would be the word for servant of God. And again, it's in the Nusk or Nuskli style. So I have actually taken this, a photograph of it. I've 
printed it out. I've cut up all those tiles. I've tried to join, uh -huh. rejoin, and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So if you think one of your visitors has said, oh, I'll do it for you and I'll get back to you, it's not gonna happen. These <laughs> tiles do not go together. In fact, it's pretty easy to see that that one right there is a completely different color. So probably from somewhere else. And yeah, the borders are different, yeah. So, good night. So that part that you think goes together, does it say anything? These two? No, this is what this is all. Uh, these are two letters, oh. cross and me. And so I don't There's know. No word There's okay. no word there, and even here, that's just one letter. And so, yeah. All right. So let's head to the north, uh, upper north duplex. Oh. So let's talk about these exquisite tiles. We know that they are 13th to 14th century from Kashan, Iran. Professor O'Kane also wrote about these tiles in the Upper North Duplex, and what he says is that they are the most interesting and rare from an art historical perspective. And he says these tiles are in a jumbled order. And he also <laughs> said, but he was very kind to track down the passage from the Quran where these mixed up words come from. So I took the liberty to go in and hone in even deeper. So he gave us the page and I went in and figured out what those where those tiles are. And so tile number, remember everything reads right to left. So tile number one is right here. Tile number two is right here. Tile number three is right here. And right to left, one, two, three. So everybody asks me, so what does it say, Sharon? So you can kind of read it there. Probably we don't have the first part of the verse, but we do have the last part, but it's mixed up. <laughs> and so it says his messenger and those who believe who establish worship and pay the, the poor do and bow down in prayer. So you know, there you go. So I find it a little, yes. Uh, and there's a Quranic verse. You're not going to see that translated in, in, into Farsi. So, at least not, in, not okay. in, in an artistic reference. So, okay, so these are from Kashan, Iran. Mm -hmm. And you're right, as a Quranic verse. And why do we have a lot of tile work? Like I showed you a couple of mosques from, from Iran. There's a lot of tile work in the, from Iran because they created beautiful tile work. And I'll talk a little bit more about that more later. And so because it is the Quran that they're copying, they're copying it in Arabic even though their own language might be Farsi, but they're using Arabic to copy. Yes. So, yes. No. If I wanted to look up that number 55 in the Quran, mm -hmm. do you know what chapter that is? Yeah. I, I've never read the Quran, so I don't know. Okay, it, so it's right yeah. here. I think it's in his um, letter. Oops. It's in his letter. He says it's in the uh, Quran 555. So um, chapter, five. Five, five, chapter 5, verse 55. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so there you go. Now I I get a little upset when I think that her you know we went to all this yeah. detail everywhere at the castle and you do have three tiles that actually go together. I mean they flow. <laughs> that goes together. Yeah. Okay, so you didn't get the first two tiles. Why couldn't you have figured out a way to at least make it right? So I get a little upset about that. It should have been one, two, three. Correct. Right. It should have been one, two, three. Maybe it says please install one, right? properly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hold on by way of idea. <laughs> so let's go to the upper north duplex mantle. Now the mantle has two styles. So I mentioned the nuts. So everything's nuts except for. And I only bring this up because people are always mentioning nusk, so I thought I'd talk about it. So the tiles in the middle are the nusk. The tiles here, on the, these tiles are all kufic. Remember, earlier I mentioned kufic is very square and angular. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to go to the first three. And look what Mr. O'Kane gives us. Uh -huh. <laughs> Mr. Hurst, come on! You know we've got yeah. we've got little bits and pieces of these tiles. So if anybody on your tour says, "Oh yeah, I could read that," well, you've got half words. You've got half words. You know this is the end, the beginning, the end of one word, and then uh, the middle, and then at the beginning of another word. So it's it's crazy. 
And then we're going to go to the tiles on the outside. Mm -hmm. Again, they're mixed up, but there's one thing that's really cool about this. I've already taught you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Do you guys want to say that? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yeah, Kim would do this on her tour, I know. So. <laughs> So right here, this tile is the first, this is this tile, I mean this uh, verse. So this is, I told you, this is the first verse at the beginning of every chapter in the Quran. And so there it is, in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. And uh, the only thing, we, we're kind of missing the last merciful. <laughs> we're missing the very last part. Oh, there it is up here. Uh, rah. We have Bismillah, Rahman, Rah. And that stops. But anybody from the Middle East who knows this phrase, which everybody does, now there are Christians in the Middle East, but even they will know this phrase. Um, you'll, they would, they would be able to recognize that. So if you have Middle Easterners on your tours, that's one thing you can point out. And uh, that if you don't remember anything else about these tiles, but you go up to the Upper North Duplex and you have a, a Middle Eastern visitor, point that tile out right there. Number one. And they will know it. They'll get it. All right. If I can remember where it was. <laughs> Uh-oh. Were you going to take a picture? I, I'm, dr I'm drawing it. <laughs> okay. You got both methods. I'll give you a comment. Maybe you can get it. It'll be too small. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Now, what Professor O'Kane says in his letter, he says, this, the most interesting and rarest tiles from an art historic perspective are these tiles in the Upper North Duplex. Mm -hmm. So I was really curious, so what the heck does he mean? He doesn't explain. So I had to start digging. And so I know that they are Iranian. I know they're from Kashan. I also know that they're Luster. And so I started to dig. And I learned a lot about Iran's luster tiles from a lecture by a historian and scholar. Her name is Dr. Keelan Overton. She's a historian of art and architecture. She's a PhD in Islamic art history at UCLA. She is widely quoted, even by the Tehran Times. So wow. She is quoted in almost every, everywhere I went, Wikipedia, everywhere. I kept finding her name. So I listened to a whole lecture about uh, by her, and then I just kept finding her name everywhere. So she is... Um, highly sought after as a historian. And she says that luster tiles were made by Iran's finest potters from Kashan in Iran. And uh, you had a question about how they would do that. So that here they are, they're brushing on the glaze to make the letters. They created metallic glazes that, that make a beautiful sheen. So you walk into a room full of tiles and it's a beautiful sheen. And the tile work from Kashan is the most exquisite and expensive tile work. And here's an example. Uh, this is the uh, uh, tiles uh, were ordered for important buildings in over 30 sites in Iran. This is according to Dr. Over o Overton. And this is an example. This is the Imam Reza, a shrine in Iran. So let's go inside. I'm sorry, this, this is a black and white shop, but this is what I found. It's old and it's from Harvard. So this is a sacred interior room at the shrine of Imam Reza in Mashhad. And we've got tiles everywhere. Tiles are lining the walls. We've got tiles that go around this area, which is called a mihrab. It's like a prayer niche. You might remember that word from your manuals on the rugs. And then we've got some tiles around here, more little tile inscriptions up here. The entire room, you can even see them over here in the shadows. So the entire room in this tomb is luster tiles containing Quranic verses. So there's a frieze, I want to point this out. There's a frieze that wraps around the room of luster tiles with Quranic verses. There it is right there. And then this is a similar <coughs> tile from the Met. Does it look familiar to anybody? Mm -hmm. Like the Turkish one? 
I believe that this is that Hearst Upper North Duplex Mantle tiles are from a frieze like this one from another shrine in Iran. Yeah. This is yeah. So when Mr. Hearst bought this stuff, did he did he were they in order or were they mixed up? So I'll address him buying these tiles in just a minute, okay. and then we'll make our own conclusion. Okay. Okay. In the late 1800s to early 1900s, luster tiles were plundered from tombs like this. This is a, a mosque in Natanz, Iran. How are you feeling about this right now? Wow. I don't feel very good about it either. I had to look at that for a long time. <laughs> so, Just think how the Iranians feel. Yes. So who's to blame? <laughs> well, before you get all upset at Mr. Hurst, Dr. Overton makes the point that it wasn't just the end buyers like Mr. Hurst or European museums that knowingly acquired these illicit tiles. It was the looters, the dealers, the foreign buyers, the museums, the buyers, the officials who granted the permits, the export permits, kind of like drugs. You, know, you have to have a, an end, a beginning and an end. And all the people in the middle. So these luster tiles are in various museums around the world, and so I started looking them up, and this is what I found. This is from the British Museum. This one is at the Met. This is at the Victoria and Albert. This is the L'Hermitage, and it goes on and on. And I found them, I just kept finding them. But before I bore you with all those, this one's Hearst Castle. <laughs> so you're saying museums are fun? No, I'm not saying that. You just did. <laughs> I said it's like drugs, it's like a ring. You've got to have a buyer, you've got to have a, a looter, and you've got to have all the people in the middle. Capitalism. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Do you have any provenance to know if maybe William bought a bunch of them and those are some of the things sold? Stores in New York in 19, yeah. Oh, I don't, I don't know about the there. department stores, but I would just bet that he probably just bought a whole crate full at auction. Yeah. And so I'll get into that a little bit. Not that, but what? Maybe he, how the museums got them? Was it really not? I think that these museums, so I, 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 it, from the evidence, it appears that you've got somebody's creating a market and, um, Museums are buying, and Hearst is buying, and it became a great business, and so why not? But the fact that nobody even cared to put the tiles in order, they just started ripping these things off the wall, putting them in, in crates. Some of them may have been broken, so if they're broken, well, Hearst not isn't getting that, so maybe he doesn't have the first verse or the first bits in the middle. He just got these, and then that museum gets those. So here's somebody we're going to talk about. Uh, he did buy and resell those, the tiles that are in the composite fireplace in the sitting room between the celestial bedrooms. Those are from a much larger collection. He liked those and he resold the others. That's right. So he did some of that too. Okay. So <clears throat> this is the art dealer, and thanks to Julie for helping me track this down. Uh, Mr. Hurst purchased the tiles in the Upper North Duplex from Mr. Kevorkian. I like to call him doctor. <laughs> <laughs> He's an Armenian art collector, an archaeologist, and a dealer in New York. And uh, we do have uh, evidence that Mr. Hurst got his tiles from Mr. Kevorkian. And Mr. Kevorkian was directing large excavations in Persia that produced antiquities for the art market and he specialized in Islamic art, and he had his own exhibit, a vast exhibit of a private collection in many galleries and museums. And I'll go back to him. The, the portrait that I found, so his resume is a mile long of all the places he's selling to, all the places he's exhibiting, and he, here he is. Where is he? He is at the National Portrait Gallery. So he's pretty well known in the art world. And so he is the go-to, I think, of finding not just tiles, but other objects as well. 
So Hearst's records say that uh, these luster tiles are from a place called Varamin, Iran. And so it just says Varamin, Iran. It says possibly from Varamin, a mosque in Varamin, Iran. He purchased these in 1922. Uh, from Kevorkian at auctions held by Anderson Galleries. And then he purchased the ones from the Mantle, uh, I think in 1923, also from Kevorkian. So here is a place called the Imam Zadeh Yahya in Varamin, Iran. And I believe it is likely that these tiles are from the Imam Zadeh in, uh, in Iran. It is a significant and cultural site it was famous for being looted. This uh, site dates back to the 13th century. Mm -hmm. And according to the Tehran Times, 160 tiles were stripped out and they, those tiles are in over 40 museums. Mm -hmm. Including this, this is a mihrab, which is a prayer niche. So this is about this high. And this particular one is today located at Shangri-La, the Museum of Islamic Art in Hawaii. Doris Duke's Shangri La. Here's a close up. I wanted to show you this because you can see these tiles on their side look a lot like Hearst's tiles in the on the mantle. So this shrine, the Imam Zade Yahya at Varamin, is where I believe Hearst tiles are likely from. It's a sacred and historic and a cultural heritage site that has suffered massive lootings and destructions, and but more recently, some renovations. Is, is there any discussion of repatriation? Not that I know of. I guess you have to have proof. Well. Yeah. So what's what's kind of interesting is this shrine will be featured in a brand new online exhibition set to launch in early 2024, developed by Dr. Keelan Overton, the uh, woman that I learned a lot from about uh, these tiles, with funding from the University of Michigan's History of Art Department. So she's doing she's uh, actually putting this on. So I look forward to that. And uh, so that just tells you how important this site is, this particular site, that there are so many tiles that were ripped out and that she is going in and doing an, ex an exhibit about this. Uh, this. So, so it's something to look just to. about that one. Uh, that's what it says. It's about that, that, shrine, that shrine. particular shrine. Wow. So that must be a very uh, significant shrine and we do have evidence from the warehouse uh, cards that they probably came from Yes. It says it's an online exhibition, so it's going to be on her website. Well, it's right there. It's, oh, um, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Humsteenislamicart.com. Got it. Sorry. No. So let's move on from tiles. Has anybody noticed this plate in the Gothic study? No. Hardly anybody. Yes. Yeah, kind of easy to miss. Here it is. And I actually saw a visitor kind of, I, I knew that this was a, had some Arabic on it, but I didn't, I tried to find out about it, it's just Islamic 20th century, but I did have a visitor one day zeroing in on that plate, and so I asked him about it, and he said, oh yeah, I can see the Arabic on there. So, <clears throat> according to Richard Felty from Hearst Castle, he wrote to USC's Islamic Department, uh, Islamic Studies Department for a translation, and they did provide us with the English text. And the phrases are on the borders of the plate. So here you can see them right here, and they're facing that way. Right here, right here. There are a few more right there on the sides, and then again right here on the sides, right here. And these phrases, according to him, <clears throat> are some basic, They are, they contain seven Arabic phrases and they're just commonly used. They're not religious. They're just commonly used phrases uh, like, um, with patience you can solve any problem. So if anybody asks you about that, seven phrases commonly used in the Middle East. And I'm sorry, but can you tell me, that one is 20th century? Uh, that uh, that's what it says in our manual. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know where from, it just says Islamic. Just, okay. So there you go, there, there, there. 
and then we'll move on to the morning room. Morning room ceiling. Now, just as a side note, some of you might remember from our last uh, discussion with Mary, I had asked a question about the word mudehar, because I find it offensive. And so I do not like using it on my term. I asked her about it, if that's uh, offensive. And she had never thought about it. So she did a lot of research and she said, well, you know, Sharon, you don't have to use it. Okay, great. Well, then she emailed me just this week and she said that she was uh, had a discussion with LACMA's head curator of Spanish colonial art. And that curator's response was, oh. She said, I dislike the concept of labeling the style, even though she wasn't even all that sure about the whole origin of the word mudejar. So Mary said, you just don't have to use it, Sharon. So I'm not using it. So what about the morning room ceiling? Uh, it's 15th century Spanish, Moorish. And I've heard guides say that the design on this beam is Arabic calligraphy. I've heard guides say it says God or praise God. Does it? Well, the design is actually an imitation Arabic. It is only a design that is meant to look like Arabic. And here is why. I took those letters, those letter-like forms, and I recreated what is supposed to look like God. So this letter here is kind of a stretch. This should not be here at all. In fact, it makes it a different letter if you do that. And it's embellished, okay? But then, that's okay. But then this loop is not a letter. So that's not, should, that shouldn't be there. So I can buy that that's embellishment. I can buy that that's embellishment, but that shouldn't be there. And that loop should not be there if we're gonna say the word God. Mm -hmm. And then I created the actual word for God using this letter form. And there it is. Mm -hmm. So it's quite different, but I can see it. People go by and they say, oh, that says God, you know, it's, it's easy to say that it does, but in reality, no, it does not. And it definitely does not say praise God. So how would you say we just, we say it's imitation Arabic? Yes, yeah, it's imitation Arabic, but I'm going to okay. keep going here. Okay. So here's a close, oh, <laughs> it's a or whatever. Yeah, it's a Moorish, Spanish Moorish. It's a design that's meant to look like Arabic, okay? So here's a closer look at what people perceive to be the Arabic right there, that little section, all right? So never mind all that, never mind all that, but it's just that little section. And then the actual word for God at the bottom. And then here's something else that's kind of interesting. It's mirrored on the other side. So the artist took the Arabic and went like this, and then they mirrored it like that. So it is a design. Okay, I don't, I've never seen this in the Middle East of somebody putting something, the words backwards. <laughs> and so why are they doing that? Just a design element? That's my opinion. So are you saying that one side of it might say God, but when you flip it over, I'm, it doesn't I'm say saying God? that one side of it could be perceived to say the word God, although it does not. The letter forms are not quite right. Okay. And uh, so what, I'll, I'll explain why people are doing this. And then the other side is mirrored and that makes it even more suspect. That's so what I'm God. saying. So yeah. God and God. God and God. Okay. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> okay. Earlier I showed you this script, all right? And I showed you that uh, this, here, here are the letter forms. And those are just knots and embellishments. And so, sure. On that morning room ceiling, we've got somebody that's look creating these knots and embellishments, and that's okay. But this is not a word. That's not a word. Okay. What is it? It's actually there's a term for it, and the term is pseudo kufic. You guys, remember kufic now? We talked about earlier. Pseudo kufic. It's also referred to as pseudo Arabic. It's also referred to as imitation Arabic. So what is pseudo -kufic? It's a decorative script that appears to be Arabic, but it's not. And it's usually in a non-Islamic or non-Arabic context. There are many examples that exist in European art from the 10th through the 15th century. So we're right in line there on the 15th century Spanish ceiling. Artists were actually attempting to create Arabic shapes without knowing what they were creating. So they're just copying. And 
How many artists do we have in here? Okay, 10. You're an artist. Artists copy. They yeah, copy each time. other. They see mm -hmm. stuff. Oh, I want to do that. They copy a style. Um, that's how we learn from each other. And um, art historians call this style of ornamentation pseudo-cufic. So you can look this up online. Look up pseudo-cufic. Go to Wikipedia. Go whatever, whatever. You'll find it all over. Reasons the artisans are imitating Arabic script. They were influenced by exotic objects brought to Europe from the Ottoman Empire. And they were just, it, they thought it was cool. It was like they were trying to create an oriental feeling. So pseudo kufic is find, found as a design element in architecture and ceramics. This is a building in Spain. This is at the Princeton uh, University mm -hmm. Art Museum. In bands as saborium, like this, which is at the Louvre, mm -hmm. and it's actually labeled as pseudo kufic mm -hmm. And in things like rugs and carpets, maybe on a painting. Mm -hmm. And it's also found in many Catholic paintings of the Virgin Mary mm -hmm. and other holy people. Oh. It's usually found on halos, but sometimes as the embroidered decoration on hems of garments and even on the edges of carpets. Here's a couple of examples. So this is by scholars who say that this is pseudo kufic all right? So right here on the border of her garment. Now, does it, does it really look like Arabic? It does not to me, okay? But this is what the scholars are saying. So this is almost like more embellished and maybe they are being inspired by Arabic. So they're calling it kufic pseudo kufic Here's another example of a Madonna painting. And uh, you can see that there on her garment. You can also see it on this painting, on her scarf. Well, guess what? What are you thinking now? Yeah. Do we have paintings that have that? Yeah. When you look at the front of the sea house, do those tiles represent anything of significance that kind of carry? You, well, that's Persian. Persian. Okay, the that's Persian, Persian, yeah. yeah. Because, because they're figures, I was just Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. Persian, yeah. So it's not Arabic calligraphy. But yeah, so we got a lot of Madonna paintings at the yeah, castle, right? Do. Do. So, Sharon, do we have any of that? Well, I took Suzanne around with me. We went around, we looked at every Madonna painting we could find, and I was super curious. I used all my breaks to go out and do this. And so I went hunting, and here's what I'll show you. Now, if those paintings, from an art historian's point of view, are like pseudo kufic well then, here's one. This is the assembly room. You walk in from the south side, and I believe it's the second one over. Now, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, they would even use it on yeah. frames. That doesn't look very pseudo kufic to me, but, you know, maybe it would be considered that by an art historian. This, on the other hand, on the garment, on the, it looks a lot like what we just looked at. Then there's this painting in the North Wing. Mm -hmm. And this looks an awful lot like what we just looked at in the paintings from historians. And here again, this is in the lower south duplex loft, so we never look at this very much. And there it is on her, her scarf or robe. And there's a closer look right over here. It doesn't look a lot like Arabic to me, but again, the whole time period is right, and it does look a lot like what those scholars are saying, uh, are interpreting to be pseudo kufic So they are being inspired by something. But this painting, I found was kind of interesting. This painting is the first one on the left when we walk into the assembly room, and look at this. That's that little Persian carpet look on the bottom. What does that look like? That yeah. was the morning room ceiling. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah. so it's definitely got the Islamic influence. Bottom line, it's got the Islamic influence. So anything else that's pseudo kufic or could be pseudo kufic So here I believe that we might have some pseudo kufic Now this is me theorizing. The Her William Hurst closet, his bedroom doors and the ceiling panels may have some pseudo kufic So this is the closet door 
And for, I do not know if this is was done by some of the, the Hearst craftsmen or if this is original. I can't find any information on that. But we do know that the, the ceiling panels and the panels on the doors are original 14th century. So it, even if artisans are copying those panels, we've got this. So I have studied this design many times right in here. I've studied this many times as I've passed by and I've you know, it kind of looks like it's some kind of language, some kind of a script. And I thought, boy, is that supposed, but in, until I started doing this presentation, I never thought about it. And I thought, is that pseudo Kufic? And one day I had a Palestinian uh, woman on my tour and she was an Arabic teacher. And she said, I said to her, I said, you know, would you just look at this for me and tell me if this is, looks like Arabic. And she looked at just, oh yeah. And she starts to point out the letters. And then she said, she got a puzzled look on her face, and she said, mm, it's Persian. Because <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't read it, right? So she couldn't read it, and so she decided it was Persian. Well, I know it's not Persian, <laughs> but it looks a lot like. So there's the door, and it looks a lot like this. So this is a Quranic manuscript from around the 10th century, and that's why I've been teaching you about Kufic. You see those angular squared off letter shapes and it looks a lot like that. So I think an artisan is trying to copy that style. And that is Arabic. This is Arabic. Okay. It's a very, very old manuscript, 10th century. So here are the applications of this, what I believe to be pseudo Kufic. This is my theory uh, in her uh, suite. So this would be the, the door, the closet door. This would be a panel, which is 14th century for sure according to our manual. Um, that's the uh, door panel on the bottom. And this is on the ceiling. These are over in the corners. You don't even see them very well. But in a letter from uh, Arthur Bine to Miss Morgan, he says half the panels consist of medieval figures and the rest are of an arabesque motif. Mm -hmm. Wrote that in 1924. Interesting. And then one more interesting note. Just like the design on the ceiling in the morning room, it's upside down. It's mirrored. It's kind of mirrored. It's not exact. But still, these little, you guys are starting to get really good. The triangulars are going up, and then these triangular shapes are going down, and the little circle, little circle. So I kind of think this might be a technique. I looked it up. I couldn't find anything on a technique of um, artisans doing this, mirroring the shapes. But it's certainly not something that you see a lot of in the Arab world. So um, I kind of have this theory that this might be pseudo Kufic as well. So if, if, if an artist is imitating an artist who already imitated another artist, it would be like a game of telephone. Mm -hmm. And by the time they got to this, it had already been completely misconstrued. Well, and, or they didn't have an original. They Kufic probably just text trying, yeah, to look just, at. No, they're just trying to create shapes that they they think look like. They're just creating shapes. Because they might not have had any of the resource materials, so they're just going with the stylized version. Yeah. So, <clears throat> in summary. Here are a few key takeaway points from tonight. I hope I have not um, bogged you down with too much information. Um, Arabic calligraphy is a high Islamic art form. Arabic and Farsi use the same alphabet. Farsi just has four extra letters. All the Arabic tiles at the castle are jumbled. And even the phrases, <laughs> and even the phrases are in bits. So. You can't put them back together. And then uh, the luster tiles in the upper north duplex are the most significant for their origins from Kashan, Iran. And pseudo Kufic appears to be present at the capital. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, guys. I didn't think anybody would show up tonight. <laughs> Yes. Uh, and, and if it is fascinating, just fascinating. But could you explain uh, a little bit more why you found you find the, the word really hard offensive? Okay. 